this at length at the work session uh, last Monday. Since then, the proposed development layout has changed. That's what I have emailed to you over the weekend and given you a hard copy this evening. Um, the original proposal was for nine dwelling units um, stacked up pretty much in a row with a single straight access drive of the East property line. Um, there's been lots of discussion between staff and the applicant um, late last week to explore some of these alternatives a little bit further. And what the applicant has come up before us, uh, with is what's before it. Um, it is a planned development under R10 zoning for eight single family detached dwelling units arranged in a pattern like you see on the master plan. Um, not in a straight line, but it's on a curvilinear street. Um, it is to be a private road um, that is built to city standards physically, but um, not a public right of way like you typically see. Um, but more typical of what you see in some other retirement communities in Valdosta, where you have a little smaller um, private road running through, um, built enough to accommodate emergency vehicles, accommodate a low volume of traffic, but not be a two-lane roadway. So they're proposing the road to curb in, come to a hammerhead-shaped turnaround, um, which means the International Fire Code, the fire department is happy with that design, and my opinion is if it can accommodate a fire truck turning around, it accommodate the garbage truck and other emergency vehicles as well. Um, that was a very important consideration for staff's review. Um, there is common space built in. Um, that is something that's not required for residential subdivisions, but the applicant is proposing it. Um, the eight foot high fence around the perimeter, um, that is to be solid opaque, basically a privacy fence. That is not required. But the applicant is proposing that. Ten foot buffer yard to go along with that. Our concern there is trees, not so much shrubbery. Shrubbery would be hidden from view. Um, but the trees of a standard, actually 20 foot buffer yard. Um, buffer yards are not required between R10 and R15 zone. So that is something that is extra. Let me call your attention to the packet where you've got some of the details. I hope you've had a chance to look at some of it. Um, you go to page four in the staff report. There's a list of deviations from the standard development code um, and some of our discussions with plan developments. That is one of the goals of plan development is to allow some flexibility in how to develop property in exchange for some other considerations. So when we review a plan development request, we need to itemize those things that do not comply with the specific requirements of, in this case, our zoning. The street design I've already mentioned, it's not conventional. Uh, minimum lot frontage for standard subdivisions, you need at least 60 feet of frontage on the street. Um, in this case, the only actual street is Eagle Road, which would only have one lot fronting. Um, the rest is a private access easement drive. Um, the lot widths of their proposed lots would vary, um, typically 50 feet or so. Some of them are quite a bit wider, so they do not comply with the 60 foot. Minimum lot area in our 10 zone is 10,000 square feet. Okay, and their density based on gross acreage um, they're averaging about 9,800 square feet, so a little bit below the R10 standard there. Lot width, of course, in R10 is 80 feet. Building setbacks, they largely comply with. Those are distances between buildings and the property lines. Um, typically, the front property line is also a street right-of-way. In this case, there is no street right-of-way. But on the development plan, you see some of the setbacks that they are proposing that vary from one house to another. Um, on the next page is some of the extras that we've touched on. One is the buffer yard, which is not required. They're proposing a house size, and R10 only needs to be 1,000 square feet. They're proposing 1,400 square feet and up. And then the neighborhood open space component in the design, that is not required for small subdivisions. That is not triggered until you reach 50 lots or more. So those are some of the extras that they're offering in exchange for some of the flexibility. Uh, like they have told you, they are marketing this for retirees. Um, we cannot legally require that it be retirees only that live here. Um, if they want to put things of that nature in the covenants, um, then they can do that. Um, that is something they're proposing as covenants. Um, the city's concern is with private road, detention facilities, other common areas, um, that someone needs to be responsible for maintaining it. And so some of that is reflected in the conditions. Um, you see, 
examples of housing type on the display boards. Those are also in your packet. That is not exactly what they're proposing to build, but it's a representative idea. Um, and so we've articulated some language about that. Um, staff has had you turn the ship around 180 degrees. We had recommended denial of the plan development a week ago. Um, but under this new design, we see things a little bit differently. A week ago, we were concerned about the lack of creativity. Um, density was, is, was an issue. It still is somewhat of an issue. But in our view, the creativity of the design is there. Um, and so to us, it mitigates a little higher density. Now, keep in mind they've gone from nine to eight. Um, the property is 78,000 square feet in size. R10 is 10,000. You do the math, it's 7.8 dwelling units, which technically boils down to seven. You have to round down. But if you think of the 7.8 being close to eight, that's sort of where the applicant is. So we're not too far off an R10 standard density anyway. All right, with all that being said, there's a lot to it. I hope you have read through here. We're back to recommending approval with seven conditions. Um, let me go ahead and read those to you into the record and we the benefit of the audience. Um, number one is approval shall be granted for an all residential plan development in accordance with the submitted conceptual master plan. The development shall consist of no more than eight site-built single-family detached homes only. The development shall include internal open space areas, guest parking, passive parks and community gardens. All other allowable uses in our zoning shall be excluded except for home occupations that generate no traffic. Uh, a lot of people forget that R10 and R15 zonings allow things other than just homes. Um, in your packet before is the rezoning request. There's a listing that shows the difference between R15 and R10. And you see some things in there, such as churches and personal care homes and things of that nature. Um, to staff, to us, it's very important that this be single family, residential only. The only exception would be a home occupation where there's no traffic. An example of that would be maybe an accountant operating out of the home and you would have no idea that they're even there. Uh, there's no signage, there's no customers, they're simply just working quietly from their house. Um, number two, all homes shall be minimum heated floor area of 1,400 square feet. At least two different basic floor plans shall be utilized in a mixed pattern with variable architectural details along the streetscape. There shall be no more than two homes having an identical front facade design. That is to prevent a cookie cutter type of pattern. Okay. Exterior design features shall be craftsman or similar style as represented by the submitted sample drawings. All yards shall be irrigated and professionally landscaped by the time of home completion. That is one of the things I think is in the letter of intent um, where the applicant is proposing to have all of the landscaping and the development managed under one entity. Number three, the development shall include restrictive covenants and a property owners association that is responsible for the proper maintenance of all common areas, shared driveway, stormwater facilities, entrance features, and internal landscape. Number four, the shared access driveway shall be a named, privately owned and maintained roadway in the form of an access easement across each lot. Pavement shall be asphalt with a width of at least 24 feet near the entrance with either road and at least 20 feet elsewhere. Sidewalks shall be omitted and curving gutters shall be deemed optional. The roadway shall otherwise be constructed to city standards as approved by the city engineer, with the proposed emergency vehicle turnaround being approved by the city fire marshal. That has already been approved. Maintenance and ownership of the roadway shall be with the property owners association and or the property owners in perpetuity. The internal roadway shall include decorative street lights and grouped mailbox. Number five, the perimeter of the development shall include a solid opaque privacy fence and a planted buffer yard. Except for the southernmost 30 feet near either road, the fence shall be eight feet high in accordance with the master plan. The buffer yard shall include a minimum of five small and one canopy tree for 100 linear feet that are all evergreen and is approved by the city arbor. Number six, the development's frontage along the Eagle Road shall include only the shared or private roadway and no other entrance drive um, also, in piping of the existing ditch in Eagle Road, as well as a decorative landscape entrance for armor fencing with the trees as approved by the city arbors. So, in other words, they're planning to landscape and dress up the entrance on Eagle Road as well as improve the side of Eagle Road that's piping the ditch and incorporate that into their entrance design. Um, there shall be no more than one entrance site for the development. 
should be a non-illuminated monument sign not to exceed six feet in height or 32 square feet in size. Straight out the city sign regulations. Number seven, development of the project shall not commence until both public water and sewer services are available from Eagle Road. Once these services are made available, development shall commence within one year and be completed within three years. Otherwise, plan development approval shall automatically expire. Currently, um, there is not water and sewer available to the property, just water. Um, the city has plans to add these services along the Eagle Road in the coming year or so. Um, not an exact timetable on that yet. Um, and this development really depends on it. Um, so until that happens, they cannot start. And once the water and sewer is available, that starts the clock ticking. They have one year to start and then three years to finish. Um, if they fail to comply with that, this whole approval of the plan development goes away automatically, and they have to start from scratch. Um, those are the conditions. A lot of language there. Um, any questions on any of this? Are there any questions from the staff, Mr. Willis? Uh, going back to the, to the uh, one year, that is going to be from the time they established this water and sewer recovery. Until the water and sewer is available for them to hook on to. That's what it's functioning, right. water and sewer, ready for them to tie right in. Right now it's only the water. Correct. Uh, I would just question that because it wouldn't be fair for the plot to start if it was approved for right now. We can see any kind of Okay. That's why we worded it that way. Point, at the point the water and sewer is present for them to Yes, sir. What I will be requesting is um, in writing from the utilities director and or the city engineer telling me that that is the case. Um, the, the applicant will be copied on that, okay. and that starts the one-year clock. Okay. All right, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak in favor of this request? Yes, 